speech by Professor uh, Lopez uh, from Aoyama Gakuen University, Japan. Uh, now he, uh, this is the uh, AI lecture series uh, at uh, University of East London, uh, uh, wearable AI for customizable activity level forecasting. So uh, the talk will cover artificial intelligence, uh, human activity and behavior understanding, especially covering sports and different healthcare applications. Uh, uh, um, uh, Professor Lopez is located in Japan. Uh, it's in Yokohama next to Tokyo. Uh, so I have never been uh, in his uh, university, but I saw his university because uh, my family members, they visited uh, many times <laughs> and lovely campus. And he also visited our university with his students last year. And one of his students visited us uh, this year uh, for a short period in my lab, and then two more will join uh, end of this year for two months as uh, visiting researchers. Uh, so we are having, uh, in Japanese, we call it kakehashi, means uh, uh, collaborations, uh, research collaborations uh, with uh, this uh, big man uh, with his uh, good lab and wonderful works. So I uh, welcome you all uh, to attend this session and enjoy. And if you have any questions, uh, you are uh, free to, I mean, just type on the chat on the fly uh, so that he can address at the end. Uh, so welcome and uh, Professor Lopez, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction, Professor Ahad. So um, what is the uh, target time? so that I can manage uh, the end. Oh, no, the target time is up to you. So it can be uh, uh, 50 minutes or one hour, no problem. Just uh, make it uh, uh, informal a bit, not infernal. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> As uh, uh, anyway, so uh, it's up to you. Uh, and okay, so it may happen that it's up to you that you can allow questions uh, in between. So if you find any questions in the chat and then mm -hmm. you'd like to address on that moment, that would be also OK. So it's totally up to you. I mean, and okay, so uh, we'll record then, uh, it and share it on the YouTube as well so that others can get the benefit mm -hmm. in the future. Thank you so much. OK, so then don't hesitate to, to ask questions and uh, interrupt me during the, the talk. Otherwise, I may talk nonstop. So, um, so today's talk title is a, I choose to call it wearable AI for customizable activity forecasting. Um, in relation with the topic that uh, Professor had uh, gave to me, so AI and activities. So, um, I will present you some examples from my uh, lab related to this topic, but also mainly some thoughts I have um, relating this topic. So it will not be too much uh, technical uh, content. So rather some results of the use of AI and uh, how um, I would expect AI to support this uh, topic. So, my name is Guillaume Lopez. I'm French and uh, I got my uh, a master degree first in France at a school called uh, I INSA. Maybe uh, in UK it's a little more uh, known than uh, in Japan. And then after uh, my master there, I, I came to Japan in uh, 2000 to, to study a little more at the University of Tokyo. So I, I had uh, at the beginning some speciality uh, in computer science, so very general um, speciality. And in the University of Tokyo, I specialized a little more on the usage of computer science technology to uh, extract information from sensors. So this was the beginning of uh, wearable computing and uh, micro sensing technologies. So that's what uh, attracted me. Then after my PhD, so I think you know the car manufacturer, and came back to the academic world uh, after some words for many reasons. <laughs> uh, and since uh, yeah, it's 10 years now that I'm uh, permanent, uh, I have a permanent position at uh, Aoyama Gakuin University. It's a private university mainly based in Tokyo, and my campus, a campus for uh, engineering, is in uh, 
in the suburb, if I can say, of Tokyo. Um, so that's it for my um, broad uh, career up to now. And um, on the uh, activity, scientific activity, uh, my main, um, if I can say, activities are, or the where I am the more active are the Academy of Human Informatics. So how to deal with uh, human information through um, IT. And also recently, uh, just one year ago, I created a, a new research group inside the uh, Information Processing Society of Japan called Behavior Transformation by IoT. Uh, so this is the second year of this uh, small group. And maybe if uh, we have time, I will talk a little about this uh, behavior transformation topic in the end uh, of this uh, keynote. So um, maybe the uh, organization of scientific research uh, in Japanese universities and in uh, UK universities is a little different. But so here I have my, uh, I'm running my own lab. So, but I'm one, only one uh, professor uh, and we, I have also one assistant professor with me and uh, we run a, a lab with mainly bachelor students, so bachelor fourth year students, master students, and uh, if we are lucky, uh, doc, PhD and postdoc students. So now this year I have, uh, if you can see the <laughs> numbers, uh, 11 bachelor, 14 master, one PhD candidate and one postdoctorate. Uh, but sometimes it's uh, half these members and sometimes it's uh, a little more. So it's quite uh, fluctuating. And my lab is, uh, is named the Wearable Inf Environment and Information System Laboratories, WIL. So as you can understand, um, our um, main research topic is the use of wearable devices uh, to get information about the environment, but also the, the human. So mainly using wearable devices, we are um, doing research on two main, uh, in two main categories. The first category is to try to extract information from these um, wearable sensors. So this is a sensing group uh, research topics. So this is mainly uh, about this, the research result of this group that uh, I will talk today. So our main uh, sensing applications are sports applications. So uh, the major part of, of today's topic. Then also uh, we have a long history of uh, doing work about eating habit quantification, but also all this mental state uh, prediction. And recently we started some research work uh, about um, fame technology. And the second uh, major axis of our research is behavior transformation. So I will less talk about it today, but uh, it's mainly on how we can use all the information we, we could extract from the research uh, on made by the sensing group. So how we can use this information to help people uh, improve their skill or have better well-being or uh, enjoy daily tasks, etc. So let's um, enter the, and start the main topic of this talk. Basically, I will uh, present these four aspects in uh, my talk. The first point I will um, raise is that we need technology to deal with uh, every single activity, every single device, every single person, every single time, because um, each activity has its specificity, each device has its specificity, Persons are different. So even an activity like walking, uh, if we look in detail, the walking pattern of a person and another, 
may differ, and even for the same person, depending on uh, how much this person is, for example, in good shape or it has some injury, maybe this activity also uh, may change with time. So this is some um, topic I will present. Then I will talk about mastery level, how we can get information about whether the activity is uh, done in a, uh, if I can say a bad manner or a good manner. Third point I will raise is about uh, the definition of activity itself. Uh, I consider that some years ago, at the beginning of activity um, computing, we were dealing only about uh, body motion and physical motion uh, activity. But nowadays, we have also to deal with uh, mental activity uh, detection. So this is some important point. And the last point is about uh, some also very important point when we are using AI, uh, especially when we are teaching or uh, feeding AI with data is to set the, the label and what is the truth. So we have to teach a truth and such the AI build a model to detect automatically this truth. And uh, when we look in detail about um, the activities we may target, sometimes we are not sure how to define well the truth. So in that cases, how can we, how we may use AI to, to deal with this uh, issue. So first point, uh, every single activity divides person and time. So uh, the application uh, I will use to, to talk about this topic is the application of activity forecasting for uh, skill detection. So what I call skill tech. Uh, it's uh, quite easy to um, understand what uh, I will talk about uh, when, if I um, explain this with examples in uh, sports. So rather than most conventional activity recognition research uh, that, has, that have been done up to now about whether detecting if someone is walking, is running, is uh, riding a train, etc. Um, we try to focus on more um, specific applications. So for example, in sports, maybe in some sports, we have several uh, type of uh, activities or of physical movements. And of course, we will try to detect what movement the user uh, is performing, but also if he's performing it well or not. So rather than trying to find AI um, techniques to automatically detect uh, daily life general activities like walking, running, etc., we will try to uh, apply AI techniques to more dedicated uh, applications. So, and in that case, why is it important? Uh, and I think as more, um, if I can say, um, maybe maybe the word is not so so correct, but more business opportunity, uh, because if we look back at all the development made about general activity recognition. Currently, in most smartphone or smartwatch, you have, of course, applications that can detect approximately uh, the number of steps, uh, detect whether you are walking or uh, running or doing a quiet activity or harsh activity. But if you think a little about that, it's not so much advanced compared to the uh, step counter device we had 20, 30 years ago. So all these research improvements that have been made about uh, general activity detection have not 
I mean, to my opinion, have not yet been uh, uh, well feedbacked in uh, in daily life and in daily uh, applications, for example. And one of the reasons is that I think it's because it's too much uh, generic. Uh, and on the other hand, if we consider more specific needs, uh, if we can de dedicate activity detection for specific sports or for specific activity, then maybe we can give uh, more added value to this uh, to the, the practitioner of these activities. For example, in, in sport, if we consider athletes, when athletes are trying to um, understand their uh, activity and the way they are doing it and try to get some feedback, sometimes, for example, they can use uh, video, they record their motion in video, and uh, then the manager or the coach gives them advice based on the, the shape of the movement, but that requires some infrastructure, other people that take the video or analyze it for you. Um, and often the feedback is based on, if I can say, a subjective uh, evaluation. So you should do the movement a little like this or a little like that. Or, and uh, one thing that AI and uh, data analysis can may, may support is to try to quanti quantify the process. So when I say the process is ju not just the motion uh, of the athlete, but also, for example, uh, where he is looking when he is doing his activity, and of course, his state of mind. So using sensor data and uh, analysis to get some quantified evaluation of the athlete's motion, uh, the athlete activity process will help the athlete to, to get some um, more objective feedback about his motion, which uh, is important then to step up and uh, try to improve what is uh, not good enough yet. So the process may be quantified and then the feedback also associated with the process may be quantified, which is, uh, I think, some very big added value for uh, assets. On the opposite, uh, for beginners also, quantifying process uh, may be uh, very uh, interesting in uh, many ways. First, because when you are a beginner, you don't have the same uh, staff support and coaching support as for athletes. So you are a little more alone. And so it's dif more difficult to, to get some feedback. But if you can quantify the process automatically and feed, uh, make some feedback with that to the, to the person, then it can have uh, some information about whether uh, what he's doing he, is quite good or uh, or not. Also, quantifying the process may help to give some uh, schematic feedback, also uh, and also ju judge the quality of the motion or, or the process. Such um, the user can position himself if he's still a beginner or how far he is to from the next level up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also this information, uh, if used well, may also be used to um, encourage and keep uh, help keeping motivation. In the case of athletes, of course, encouragement and motiv motivation keeping is not so much uh, necessary. Usually athletes uh, don't need such uh, effort, but for beginners, it's quite important. Uh, to get encouragement and some uh, some things that help keep motivation to avoid stopping the the activity after some uh, some trials. And this uh, quantification of skills has some uh, requirements that are it should be seamless and unconstrained. 
seamless uh, in one sense is that, for example, uh, I suppose that uh, many of you know examples of uh, sports skill quantification using, for example, motion capture or very expensive equipment. We can see recently in uh, pro sports um, some usage of quite advanced techniques to quantify uh, athletes' uh, performance, but it's only available to very, uh, if I can say, uh, rich structures. So not for everybody. So we need some way that is without being too much dependent from uh, infrastructures or uh, expensive material equipment. Uh, then we need also this uh, quantification medium to be as much as possible, um, of course, lightweight or uh, wearable. Such this quantification process is done unconstrained because um, I think everybody knows that you can get very good uh, systems by analyzing data taken in some environment, uh, some, sorry, experimental environment. So in experimental context with very um, specific constraints to, to have very beautiful uh, data. But in real life, uh, I mean, when or when you do real practice of so, of such sports, uh, it's usually unconstrained environment. So your models or AI techniques should be able to to work in these unconstrained conditions. That means natural movement. That means that you don't have all, only uh, beautiful targeted activities, but also intermediate motions or intermediate status that are um, that may be considered like noise. And also you need to, to use device or equipment that will not affect the way you perform your activity. Uh, if you have, for example, if you wear too many sensors and uh, heavy equipment, this will uh, constrain your motion or your uh, performance uh, in practicing your activity, or this may be dangerous. Uh, so we need some equipment that enable unconstrained um, practice. And that's why uh, one of the big, I think, challenge is as you can see in this uh, picture in the bottom of the slide, ideally, if we get a very um, high level infrastructure uh, with motion capture or any uh, super uh, uh, camera infrastructure, then we can get very high quality and high accuracy data. Um, but if we are using just a simple uh, smartwatch, for example, then the data we get are uh, not so much accurate. We have also, uh, so the sensors are less accurate. The sampling rate, so the frequency we get data is uh, less frequent, et cetera, et cetera. So in that condition, since our data are less, um, if I can say, uh, less high quality and uh, less descriptive, uh, it's more difficult for also for AI algorithms to find uh, information or to make the difference between different activities with um, less descriptive data. If uh, I can, give an easier example is when you try to make um, some image recognition with a high definition video camera or with a 
very old webcam with a low sampling rate and low definition. Of course, your uh, algorithm or uh, your uh, machine learning models will not have the same performance with data from high definition camera and with data from low definition web camera. So this is one uh, important point, I think, when uh, and we have to deal with this to be able to provide um, this skill quantification technology to uh, to support this kind of uh, activities quantification. Another point I think uh, is important is that we need, so it's not yet the AI point uh, of the talk, but it's a little, uh, uh, all the constraints that will be important for uh, the, the AI techniques um, after. So when we are using some specific equipment or wearable devices, something I, I could, uh, I mean, um, uh, sorry, um, something I realized when I saw different uh, examples of techniques is that sometimes we see some um, device maker that are developing specific uh, devices to for some specific activity. Um, I think it's very very nice uh, idea, but for example, if I if I may uh, give some concrete example. Um, some tennis related uh, maker made some device you put on your uh, tennis racket uh, hand part to collect uh, tennis stroke information. Uh, you can get, of course, very nice uh, data, but um, users need to buy this specific device also, they can get their skill information only when they with the racket that to which this specific equipment is set, uh, et cetera, et cetera. For example, if in baseball or in soccer, you may have some board with some sensor inside, but you can get then your um, skill quantification information only when you use this specific board. So the usage is quite limited. Uh, on the opposite way, if we can develop AI technique that uh, uses or that is usable on top of what I call uh, usual gear. So for example, a very simple example, uh, your daily smartwatch or the earphone you are using in daily life. Maybe it's uh, there is better chance than that the user uh, will use your technique and that your technique will really be the, uh, be uh, uh, usable and fruitful for uh, to give information to to many users. Because the main purpose you will have is not to buy, for example, a watch especially dedicated to collect your uh, tennis skill. You will have a watch just for your daily life and you may add some soft, just some software application that will enable uh, tennis skill quantification. Be a dedicated gear, gear, but a generic gear. And I think this uh, point is important so that the more user uh, as possible, use your uh, your technology. So trying to make the technology more software than software dependent rather than uh, hardware dependent. Another point, uh, the, the last point, the freedom of movement uh, is quite related with I, what I just said uh, in the slide before with uh, the fact of uh, the point of being uh, unconstrained. So try to having less sensor as possible. Um, and of course, recently we have the chance that uh, wearable devices are 
more and more well designed and small such uh, just putting you one wristwatch will not bother your way of uh, playing tennis or throwing your a ball if you are doing some baseball etc uh, so this is the sub point but the second point so feedback and skill up uh, even around I think is important on the feedback point of view and on how much your uh, technology will be really useful and will uh, really support the, the user. Uh, I know many applications and system uh, that can get very uh, accurate information about motion or uh, different kind of activities, but um, I have the image that most of the system, for example, collect data from sensor. The sensor are paired with the smartphone. So the smartphone has to be within some communication range with the sensor. So this is one point. Then the smartphone usually sends the data to the cloud. And in the cloud, there is, uh, of course, some storage, but also some cloud processing to, to be able to make uh, high performance computation to extract accurate data. And usually, then the result is stored again in, in a cloud database, and the user can see the analysis of his activity, uh, maybe uh, in the night or the next day, looking at uh, his, uh, what we can call my page. So this is quite, uh, if I can say, a conventional, a standard uh, way to, uh, I mean, for many systems. But in our case of uh, trying to support skill improvement, we may uh, guess or we may um, think whether it is really useful to provide the feedback on the my page that the user may only consult, uh, for example, several hours after he finished his activity. And many hours be before he begins or he starts again a, a new session of, of this activity. For example, uh, I take often the example of tennis, but you can make your tennis training and using some specific technology, quantify your uh, your your play. And once after you finished uh, playing, maybe uh, at night after taking your shower and uh, going back home, you can, if you have time, check your my page to see how what how was your uh, training session. But then maybe you don't have um, uh, you don't have any more a concrete image or you cannot remember very well how was your uh, feeling at the time you were playing during this uh, training session to compare the result to understand uh, very well the result. Also, your next training session is maybe one week ago, uh, the next week. So can you? Is it or uh, can you apply or take make in application the feedback content one week later? So uh, I think this is some drawback of most current system. And uh, to avoid that, we need to provide the feedback as much as possible at a timing where it can. Uh, if I can say it just after finishing, if I can say uh, one session of one part of the session or one uh, sub activity, and also at the timing search, it's not so far from the next time you um, you practice uh, this, you perform this activity. Uh, so that's why, as much as possible, the real time processing and also online processing. That means processing not on the cloud, but as much as possible inside your wearable device is something important. Because in some, if you are, if you want to um, 
detect activity in real conditions and not experiment con experimental condition. Uh, still, the example of tennis. If you use, for example, like a lot of sensors are using Bluetooth to connect your sensor to your smartphone. Usually, the communication distance is about uh, 10 meters maximum. 10 meters, it's uh, less than the distance you may have between the back of the tennis court and the, for example, the bench where you have all your bags and smartphone on the side of the tennis court. So while you are playing, you may have the risk to get some um, uh, disconnection between the sensor and the smartwatch, the smartphone. So uh, when you want to get this information and this analysis in real condition as much as possible, real time and uh, processing inside your wearable device is uh, something uh, important. So for um, this last, uh, sorry, point of the freedom of movement and uh, avoiding multiple sensors and avoiding also, I, uh, I think the, the usage of uh, smartphones, because in a, for example, in a real uh, tennis training, you cannot, um, usually you don't let your smartphone in your pocket, for example. Or if you are swimming also, you don't keep your smartphone uh, on you. Uh, so as possible, uh, I would like, it's preferable to, to avoid it. Fortunately, recently we have, uh, as I said in introduction, more and more uh, very, um, uh, if I can say, well designed and uh, quite uh, small and well uh, finished uh, wearable devices. The most well known are, of course, smartphone or smartwatch. Uh, earphone also maybe is not uh, sometimes considered or um, is not uh, recognized as a wearable device, but uh, earphone is a very good wearable device since it has both uh, sensing medium, so the microphone, and also a feedback medium that is the uh, um, speaker. Uh, also glasses, recently we see more and more uh, glasses, for example, with uh, some kind of speaker inside the branch or some uh, accelerometer inside the branch. So um, we may get some, we may sense some information from glasses. But uh, we have also, of course, this kind of sensor you put on your chest, maybe a little more uh, uh, familiar to, to persons practicing some sports, but uh, um, we have more and more sensors like that. We have a smart ring. I think um, some of you may, may know this uh, ring. I think there is some uh, chat question, sorry. Yeah, uh, from uh, Ijaz, the question is about mm. Uh, if you can read, or at the same time, I can just read like. So, uh, lots have of you questions. considered like uh, XR or hologram technique? Uh, mm. Mm. Okay, so for this, uh, for, um, my proposition, if I can say, of processing real-time XR shadow of an athlete rather than use uh, physical sensors. Um, in that case, we will need to uh, create an accurate XR shadow. So how do we create this uh, X accurate XR shadow? We will need some information, uh, some sensing at some moment, uh, maybe, of course, it can be wearable, but it can be, of course, uh, camera or vision related sensors, of course. But we will need to create this uh, accurate uh, XR shadow. So, and if we want that this um, XR shadow based activity detection be usable in real um, condition environment, we also need to 
to create this XR shadow uh, hologram from data collected in real uh, environment. So um, the, the, the initial problem I think is the same, uh, but then once we could get this uh, accurate uh, data set, of course it may be uh, one interesting uh, way to, to use this uh, XR and uh, uh, technology to have, um, if I can say, for example, to um, um, extend the data set that will be necessary for better uh, AI forecasting. Because this is only one point uh, I wanted to talk in uh, today is that since we deal with human activity, which is uh, a big difference with um, uh, vision detection or uh, sound analysis, is that we have we, we need a human to make a motion. So we cannot uh, copy paste this uh, motion since every human also has his very single specificity. In image, you have thousands or millions of images on the web you can collect. So uh, it's easier to big to create big data set. And uh, creating big data set with the human activity is quite uh, a big issue. So using this um, um, XR technique to try to create more easily uh, bigger data sets may be uh, something uh, interesting, I think. Yeah, thank you for the comment. OK, so I will. Uh, is it uh, OK, uh, my uh, my response? Yeah. Hey, yeah, I'm just going to jump yeah. in. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's just a just a just a thought, you know, I thought, you know, maybe just pass on to you. And mm -hmm. honestly, you know, because I was involved uh, with a couple of workshops with the XR mm -hmm. and and augmented reality. So mm -hmm. um, that just seen how it's been used in a uh, a physical environment, especially. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, you know, just to share it, you know, maybe, you know, something, okay. you know, um, mixing it, you know, with a different uh, experience. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So I will uh, keep on. Yeah, proceed on, please. Yeah, okay. thank you. So we have also insoles, smart insoles with kind of pressure sensors, but also some uh, actuators in it. We may have some hat like wearable devices. Uh, with the COVID-19, we have seen suddenly a uh, smart mask <laughs> appearing uh, on the market. So um, also scarf or necktie-like uh, devices. So what I want to say here is that uh, recently, uh, myself, even as a, if I can say a specialist in uh, wearable uh, sensing, uh, I prefer use the the word accessories than uh, wear or devices, because accessories are kind of I mean stuff you put some days you don't put on other days. Depending on people, the accessory you get you have uh, is not the same. So I may wear glasses, but no no don't wear a watch, uh, don't wear a ring. Uh, another person will don't will not have glasses but a watch. So this is also some. Um, or, sorry, <laughs> uh, I don't know why I came back. <laughs> so this is also some point that is um, important because uh, we cannot, if I can say. Uh, I mean, so that our technology is used the more as possible. We cannot um, give a, too much constraint to the user about uh, the kind of device he has to use to get some support. So this is, uh, I will give you a concrete example of what uh, 
I am uh, saying now. Um, so usually when we try to quantify exercise and to forecast exercise, we need to be independent from the place the user is practicing. So whether he's practicing in a gym, he's practicing at home, outside. Uh, that's why being dependent on some infrastructure is quite constraining. Also, we need to be independent from the device type the user uh, has. So since you can see in, in the former slide, there are many smart wearable accessories, but depending on the person, the accessory you have will be different. So we need our system to be flexible and uh, work with different type of devices. Also, uh, it's quite connect connected with the device type. Depending on the device type, the, the mounting position will change. Uh, if you have a watch, of course, it will be mounted on the wrist, so you will get activities, information, movement information from the wrist movement. But if you have an uh, earphone, you will have the motion from the head. If you have a heart rate sensor, you will have motion information from the chest. So uh, when you want to detect activities, you, be, you will be, uh, you will need to be able to deal with uh, several mounting positions. Also, um, the last point is about um, trying to be flexible. Uh, one maybe difficult point uh, in uh, AI or in machine learning is we have this uh, learning process where once we succeeded to learn uh, correctly or correctly um, accurately enough. Then the recognition and the forecasting step is not so much uh, difficult. But uh, in this learning process, that means that when you want to add some new exercise type, some, some new uh, function, then you will have to uh, learn again. So of course, I know that uh, recently there are some uh, many techniques like um, uh, federated learning and uh, such techniques that enables from a existing model to extend this model to be able to manage some new uh, new label or something like that. But still, we will need to to collect data about this new. Uh, label is new exercise type, rebuild, the, update the model and redeploy it to existing users. So this is some somehow quite um, constraining step, I think. Uh, oops. So one uh, study we have done. Uh, about the mounted, mounting position of the uh, devices uh, was trying to uh, forecast exercise type. So uh, we forecast, we targeted uh, five exercises, running, walking, uh, push-ups, sit-ups, and jump. One thing uh, interesting also here is that usually, uh, in activity uh, forecasting, we often uh, see studies that uh, focused on um, activity types or exercise types that have similar um, similar patterns. For example, running and walking are repeated activities. So we can use, for example, uh, easily the frequency to, to, to make the difference between uh, one and the other. Uh, but for in the case of push-ups or sit-ups, even if they are repeated activities, the frequency of this activity is very different from the frequency of repetition of some running or walking exercise. So it's 
quite difficult to uh, be able to detect or to forecast in the same system uh, this kind of uh, running walking activities that usually you perform outside from activities like push-up, sit-ups you may perform indoor at uh, gyms or in your uh, home. And uh, so, as I said several times, each user may have his own uh, device. Some of them may just have the smartphone and put it uh, uh, in the uh, upper arm when doing sports. Uh, another user may have a smartwatch, another one only have his, his uh, earphone to listen to music while uh, doing his exercise. Uh, other ones may have a chest uh, sensor to to measure his uh, heart rate, for example. So, if we want some to provide some running, walking, push-ups, sit-ups, jump uh, exercise, forecasting, uh, if I can say system or uh, application, we it's better if our system can work with any of these devices so that the user is not constrained, can just use the device he has with him uh, without thinking of buying some specific uh, equipment. And we tried so um, to see how was uh, the uh, exercise forecasting accuracy. And of course, some for, for these five types of exercise, uh, we had better results with uh, devices were mounted at the chest or at the uh, arm. But uh, we could, I mean, get quite uh, sufficient accuracy, about uh, more than 80% 80 uh, 80 for any kind, uh, any uh, mounting position. So this is some. Um, some things that is that I think is important for uh, applications or for technologies to be used by uh, as many users as possible. Um, so up to now, I've just talked about uh, detecting specific activities. And one other uh, thing I think is important in activity forecasting is not to just uh, automatically detect and count what you have uh, done, but try to evaluate uh, if it has been done in a good manner or in a bad manner, or um, if we can have several uh, mastery levels, try to um, evaluate, judge these uh, levels. A little like if uh, I can say like the judges in uh, gymnastics or uh, ice dance, etc. So each movement is done or not done, but also has some evaluation, some grade, depending if it's done in a, in a good or bad manner. So we may use this um, uh, AI techniques to be able to evaluate automatically this mastery level. And this would enable to, to give a more detailed feedback to the user. Because uh, often there are many issues uh, when we are practicing uh, exercises. So we have seen just uh, before that uh, the place of practice uh, is important. Of course, the money is important. That's why generic the use of generic uh, device is quite important. Uh, but then, we need some good feedback to try to motivate the user when it's not uh, a professional or some uh, athlete, but also having information um, about the form you are performing each movement is important to, uh, of course, related with um, continuity to be able to have some feedback uh, whether you are doing good or, or not. Often being able to, to have someone practicing with you is also important. And we have seen that uh, during COVID, it was uh, sometimes difficult to, 
to um, to continue perform some exercise, even uh, I mean, often because you are alone and uh, uh, having some partner or some rival to is important to, to keep motivation. Um, and also, yeah, uh, to uh, demonstrate the, the point uh, I told a little uh, before about adding some new exercise type. Uh, this is more on the system point of view. Um, how can we um, extend the system in a more uh, easy uh, way? And uh, one thing we tried is to combine not just uh, AI or machine learning techniques, but try to use also more um, more basic uh, signal uh, or um, if I can say um, yeah, signal comparison techniques. So I don't know how much of you are familiar with uh, uh, DPW techniques, the uh, dynamic time uh, wrapping. Uh, hey. uh, what could be reason for chest sensor to provide higher accuracy? Uh, in the case, yeah, solid positioning, but uh, rather than solid, is that um, there is the chest has less parasite motions, if I can say. So uh, for the five exercises uh, we had, running, walking, jumping, push-ups, the trunk, so the chest motion is uh, very uh, clear compared to other parts where there is, for example, your head is a little shaking, uh, etc. So there is less parasite motion, less noise, so uh, that's why uh, I think we think that uh, it's easier to get a higher accuracy. Um, and so uh, to try to evaluate uh, the quality of emotion, but also uh, we sought a method to uh, try to extend in a simple way, uh, our system. And for that, using DTW or correlation-based method are quite uh, interesting. Uh, for that, of course, we need to find some uh, signal uh, that represent strongly what you want to uh, evaluate. Um, but uh, in our case, it uh, work, worked quite uh, nicely. So even without using AI or machine learning, we could get this uh, test uh, mounted uh, higher reason. Uh, um, and to, I have some uh, videos that shows you um, how it can be used. So for example, we use some this algorithm, if you can see the video in the lower part. So we use this uh, wrist mounted sensor like a smartwatch. Sorry, the, the explanations are in Japanese, but, and uh, we created some um, AR shooting game based on the wrist motion. So at first the game provides some uh, motion analysis to detect your uh, shooting motion. And once it detects the shooting motion, you can, uh, the AR game sends a ball to try to, uh, to uh, touch this uh, big um, target. And next, in the game, the target starts to send some uh, attack. So, we think the user may think, yes, I want to add some new uh, activity that will correspond to some protection motion. So um, the user here uh, will add a gesture to uh, 
uh, resistor new gesture to uh, protect himself. So he swing his arm once, and by analy analyzing this one motion, this one motion is then registered in the system, and once the user again performs this motion, the system can automatically uh, record it. So now he has been uh, killed because his uh, reaction was too late. But uh, using uh, acceleration data, segmentation, uh, template, so we use this uh, template that represent uh, a good motion, for example. So this template will be uh, our reference to evaluate whether the user is performing uh, good or not uh, the motion and whether the user is performing throwing motion or protection motion. And this kind of using DTW or uh, um, Sorry, this is another uh, video, but so using DTW or correlation like uh, method are quite uh, interesting in that way that we don't need many, many data to, to train our model. We need just one nice template uh, signal to as a reference for, for our new machine. Of course, I'm aware that uh, it's not working for any kind of uh, exercise, but uh, it's interesting in some specific cases. And from this um, example of you using a template, what is also interesting is that we can, for example, so in that case, the user recorded the template itself, but uh, we can imagine that the template is recorded by some professional or from a coach. So we have the template of uh, a good, if I can say, motion. And then we may use this good template to evaluate not only whether the user performs this motion or another motion, but depending on the distance between the template and the user um, activity, we can, we may evaluate whether the user performs the activity good or, uh, or bad. So using this kind of template information uh, and this uh, similarity score is uh, interesting to analyze the mastery level of uh, users. Of course, we can also use um, AI techniques uh, in another study, we used uh, hidden Markov models to evaluate um, eating behavior, oh, no, sorry, to evaluate uh, some behavior in several, in uh, seven levels. Uh, and so it was also working uh, very well. But trying to not only detect the activity, but activity level is uh, very interesting when it is uh, to to provide some feedback. Yeah, sorry, I'm uh, I'm speaking <laughs> too much, maybe. Uh, so, concerning skill, uh, sorry, skill quantification, we have some. We have had some. Uh, concrete uh, works. So the one I presented you was quite, uh, was related with exercise monitoring. Um, but we had also works uh, for uh, pitching. So maybe in UK, baseball is not so much uh, famous, but for uh, it's famous in Japan. So uh, pitching is support. So it's uh, throwing a ball. Tennis support, so not only serve, but uh, uh, a wall rally, so for forehand, backhand, volley, etc. And also recently we are uh, doing some works uh, on soccer skill detection. So basically trying to use the same uh, idea of first detecting each activity type and then 
uh, trying to detect uh, the mastery level or, or the level uh, of each specific uh, activity. Uh, also, one thing uh, maybe related to this uh, comment about uh, using uh, AR or XR technology, um, trying to connect people that are doing the same activity in different places, connect them together to just to be together or for some kind of uh, to create some kind of um, rivalry. So we also propose some system where you can uh, run in different place, but at the same start at the same timing and try to compete together. So sharing uh, position and uh, uh, exercise information in real time between person at different places uh, so that they can encourage each other or try to uh, be more motivated to to make uh, an exercise with a stronger or higher load. Uh, so about this uh, skill detection and support uh, research topics, we are uh, trying to apply that to different kind of sports and trying to make some uh, general uh, if I can say, a uh, framework to be uh, usable by uh, any kind of, of sport. So it's uh, still uh, ongoing work. Uh, the next point about the body and soul. So I talked mainly up to now about the body physical activity uh, detection issues and uh, important, uh, I think, point. Um, one other point in recent activity uh, forecasting or activity detection is that more and more we see works on not only physical activity detection, but mental activity detection. And I think the, um, there are many common uh, issues in both um, body and uh, mental activity uh, detection. So of course, uh, mental activities are very uh, and health uh, habits are very important for our daily life. It's not only doing a sport, but uh, trying to have a healthy um, everyday life, both through eating, but also on, on the mental uh, status, mental aspect. Uh, so we have also the, not only sports, physical activity uh, research, but also trying to use this activity detection uh, technology for, um, in our concrete uh, example, uh, health habit detection. So when we are uh, eating, we are using, of course, our hand, our mouth, etc. So we are proposing several um, solutions to detect, uh, to quantify uh, how people are eating. So not just quantifying as we uh, can see um, the content of the meal through the calories or uh, uh, such things, but tr try to see how the person is eating. If the person is eating quickly or is eating too much, is chewing a lot or not chewing enough, so try to use this um, wearable sensing or smart accessories to detect uh, or to quantify uh, the way people are eating and also um, provide feedback in real time. Uh, because as I said a little earlier about the on-site and real-time feedback, if you make, for example, a feedback about what you eat at the end of the day, maybe next day in the morning or in the lunch, you will forget what was uh, the feedback. But if you can provide the feedback in real time that support you change your behavior in real time, then uh, it's maybe more efficient. So for that, we will need to use, of course, 
uh, AI and uh, signal analysis technique that are available in this very small uh, smart device, smart accessory uh, environment. So we cannot use very advanced uh, or high power um, uh, AI algorithms. And uh, we need also algorithms that can calculate and estimate what the user is doing uh, as much as possible in, in real time to provide also the feedback uh, in real time. So for example, we have uh, a work that demonstrated that by measuring in real time the mastication count and showing on a smartphone application in real time how many times you are chewing your food, 100% of people will have 20% more chewing uh, actions than without any feedback. So showing, giving some real-time information to the user about the way he is eating uh, helps the user change or improve his eating behavior. And uh, also the second aspect about the satiety uh, this is something that we cannot measure by, by the behavior, by the motion. So this is some uh, internal, if I can say, status uh, of the human. So it's like a mental status. And we could also uh, find some uh, in vital signs that um, help detect the timing where the user is uh, full and should, uh, if possible, stop eating to avoid um, to avoid um, creating some too much stress to his um, to his body. So for example, we are we were using the uh, heart rate uh, variability to evaluate the autonomic nervous uh, uh, hmm? Uh, AS, so, so autonomic uh, nervous system activity. And we could detect, find that when you are eating, start eating, the point where you have some kind of uh, valley in, uh, in the um, heart rate variability index correspond to the timing where you are full. And if you continue like in the lower graph, if you continue eating after this point, then you have a big increase in stress. So uh, it's important also when you analyze, for example, eating behavior to uh, be able to detect this kind of uh, eating mental status to perform, to provide some feedback uh, that will help the user uh, eating in a more healthy way. Uh, so, and also we have the same study also in sports. So in the skill technology uh, example I gave you, uh, it was up to now mainly based on motion and physical motion analysis, but also in sports, maybe uh, more for the athlete we often hear that the mental status of the athlete is important for uh, or is strongly connected with the performance. But we have never uh, seen any uh, objective study that uh, evaluate uh, or that quantify this uh, mental status of athlete. And uh, if in our university, we have the chance to have some uh, uh, athlete level um, um, students. Uh, in our case, it was for uh, sprint athlete, 100 meter and uh, 200 meter. So we could demonstrate that when the athlete, so the, the person, not only stress, but also relax um, signal are both activated. 
then the performance is uh, is the best. So we we could demonstrate on a quantitative uh, manner that both stress and uh, relax are two important uh, condi mental conditions to provide or to perform uh, good. So this is the kind of feedback we can provide uh, to athletes, not only tell them uh, information about the way they are performing their uh, activity, but also the, their mental status when they were performing so that they can may have better understanding uh, explanation about, about their uh, performance. So more and more uh, activity computing is also about uh, mental status uh, forecasting. One of our study is about uh, affective computing and more especially about uh, thermal comfort. So I think that uh, now, both in Japan and in UK, we are uh, we have a lot of um, issue and a, a big concern about uh, thermal comfort in summer with very high uh, temperatures and uh, humidity and uh, an increasing number in uh, heat stroke. So this is the kind of condition that we, we need to, um, to detect. And here, what is, uh, when we are dealing with mental status uh, and mental activity detection, one important and one big issue is compared, I mean, if we consider AI and uh, conventional machine learning, um, for mental activity, uh, one big issue is to know what is the true level. So even for stress or for thermal comfort, uh, we know that every person is feeling different, and but each person, we are not sure that, uh, for example, if I say I'm hot, I feel hot, maybe it's true in most cases, but for example, for elderly, we know that they have some uh, temperature, thermal sensory, uh, reaction, um, if, if I can say, uh, uh, deterioration that makes them make some mistake in their feeling uh, about the thermal comfort. So even about stress, sometimes someone say, oh yeah, I'm stressed, I'm nervous. But in fact, looking at his vital signs, uh, that is not the case. So, so uh, in many one uh, big issue in affective, um, affective uh, activity detection is how can we be 100% sure about the label we are uh, making our model uh, learned. So recently we have, uh, I think maybe you have uh, heard about studies concerning biased, biased uh, label. So try to find some way to correct the uncertainty uncertainty in uh, in the labels you are using for to train your machine learning models so in our case for uh, thermal comfort detection of course uh, there are some two two ways of defining um, the label i'm not sure yeah. Uh, one way on the left side is using environment defined thermal comfort, usually using the predicted mean volt PMV. So this is some label defined by the environment temperature, humidity, um, the activity, physical activity you are performing, the clothes you are wearing. So it's defined by the environment and not by what the person is uh, really feeling. On the opposite, on the right side, you, you have the self-assessment, what the person is oh, feeling. Uh, Professor Lupez, yeah. <laughs> just to mention that we uh, spend uh, almost uh, 80 minutes, yeah. 
So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I will conclude yeah. uh, here. Very quick. Okay. Yeah, just you can go up, uh, just quickly uh, cover because mm. I can notice that still you have almost 40% <laughs> more slides or not. Okay. I'm not sure. No, no, it's okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, can so we can see minutes, here easily yeah. that there is a difference between environment defined comfort and self defined comfort. So, how, which label should we use to, to, um, to make our machine learning models. So this is some issue uh, uh, that we have to deal with. Also, depending on the people, uh, for example, male and female difference, age difference, if we build models, for example, for everyone, we have worse performance than when we build men only, male only model, female only model, under 50 only model, over 50 only, uh, only models. So to, to the extent we should build one model for each individual maybe, and maybe change the model when the person is, go is getting older, but it's quite uh, difficult. Uh, okay, I will stop here. Uh, in the end, I had some slide about how to make uh, efficient feedback to support uh, user behavior uh, transformation. Uh, that is, uh, I think, one important uh, issue to uh, to make the best use of all this information we could detect it from uh, uh, activity uh, forecasting. Okay, so, and this is the end. <laughs> Sorry for uh, speaking. No, 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 not sorry at all. You uh, have sorry. plenty of works and amazing, amazing presentation indeed. Um, and you clarified, especially you explained the uh, uh, problems and issues and challenges. So everything uh, wonderful, wonderful indeed. So uh, this FIN fin is uh, French? Yeah, yeah, it's French. It's uh, Oh, okay. And so I learned <laughs> another French word. <laughs> All right, so, so thank you very much. So uh, now we already had a couple of questions uh, uh, from the audience. So if you have any more questions, please ask uh, in the chat or you can directly ask here. Unmute yourself and uh, please. So any questions from the audience? Okay, while we wait for uh, questions uh, from somebody else, uh, if you have questions, you can just raise your hand and then unmute and ask all right you can type so uh, i have a query like regarding the sport activities uh, what i understand that the number of subjects are always not so much uh, so based on uh, this uh, set of uh, subjects uh, do you think that we can uh, get any comprehensive uh, idea about the result because i know that they are not much work so when their data sets are I mean, some cases we need millions of people and some cases even 20 people is good because no data set yet. So this is uh, one uh, query from my side. So indeed one uh, big issue when we are dealing uh, with uh, human data set is that uh, mm -hmm. every human is uh, unique. Mm -hmm. So even when we consider walking, everyone has his uh, own walking uh, pattern. But of mm -hmm. course, in that, in that different, in these uh, differences, we have, mm -hmm. of course, some uh, common pattern. So uh, how much we can find this uh, common, uh, for example, walking wave that everybody has and uh, separate from the, the small differences. So in sports also, this is important and um, if we can find this uh, I mean, common pattern, then the number of uh, people is not so much important. But mm. uh, yeah, indeed, since we use human and the human time is, <laughs> is a real time, uh, we cannot fast forward and accelerate and etc. It mm. takes a lot of time uh, and effort to, to gather uh, many, many people uh, data. So. Uh, and often many techniques uh, are very uh, dependent on uh, having data. I mean, they can work well with uh, 
uh, if they have data about all the users, but when you have a new user, so an unknown user, then mm. the model uh, will uh, accuracy will uh, drop down. This is a very uh, common issue in uh, human activity and especially in a mental uh, activity detection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any questions from anyone? OK, so uh, I have another um, point uh, or query. This is uh, uh, regarding you mentioned about the Mm, uh, sports and skill up and skill transfer uh, for athletes and for beginners. And you mentioned two different things like ath athletes are professionals, beginners are not professionals, as we understand. So, mm, but when we make our data set, basic, most of the cases we depend on uh, uh, our students, like students uh, wear sensors and then they uh, jump or do some activities. But in real life, we try to implement it uh, for the athletes. So, I mean, uh, how much compromise we need to do? Uh, is it better to hire the um, semi-professionals or professionals uh, at the initial stage of research and data collection or not? So, um, what up to know what we have done is that uh, usually um, in our lab, we only do, uh, I mean, this uh, kind of sports activity uh, topics only when we have uh, a student that is maybe not an athlete but quite an expert so with several years of experience of these sports mm. so uh, we will be able to have expert level data and also uh, with normal students beginner level data so for example for the uh, 100 meters a sprint, we had a student mm. running uh, 100 meters at 10.5 seconds. So very mm. uh, like professional level. Mm. That's why we could make research on that. For tennis, we had uh, the student starting that had more than 10 years experience in tennis. So of course, we need to have uh, expert data Otherwise, we will not be able to, to know what is the, the correct uh, activity and we, do, we don't have correct uh, reference motion data. So, uh, But uh, in the lab, we try as much as possible to, to get uh, data from at least experienced uh, students. Uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. Any questions? We don't have any raise, hand raise, but I have more questions to learn from you. It's a good chance. So uh, another point is that uh, regarding athletes, you uh, mentioned that the, uh, the process needs, of course, the motion, like uh, physical on-body motions and eye information, like eye uh, contact and or something like this. And mind, you mentioned about the mind. So the point is that uh, based on the sensors you are exploring, you are not considering mind. Uh, because the sensors, uh, it's basically um, going for physical movement analysis, not like mind. And doing movement uh, to understand mind, we need different kinds of sensors. So uh, what do you comment about that? Or do you have any plan to incorporate mind and also the eye? Because you mentioned eye, unless we use uh, any kind of uh, HR or VR um, or any glass, something like this, then it's very difficult to track the eye movement or eye information or eye tracking information. Uh, so if I, I missed anything, just please let me know. Yes, of course, in this, uh, in the first slides where uh, I put uh, motion, eye and, and uh, mental, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it was, I mean, a general uh, vision, okay? Oh, so okay, okay, okay. I, okay. I don't use everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Up to now, indeed, I did not uh, use the, any uh, eye motion informa information, but mm -hmm. uh, as you said, we may use uh, glasses and uh, um, in uh, we see many athletes wearing glasses uh, when they are performing sports, so it won't mm -hmm. be a, an issue, I think. For the mm -hmm. mental uh, part, I don't know if you can see on the photo here, where yeah. we are trying to get mental information we use of course 
uh, a sensor that enables to extract um, signals related with mental uh, information. So for concretely, uh, heart rate variability data. So in the case of the athlete, we use some uh, uh, chest worm sensor to get heart rate variability. Recently, the smartwatch, uh, some smartwatches uh, unable to get uh, not heart rate, but pulse rate information. So um, we can make analysis from the pulse data. Uh, we can analyze it and uh, extract some information about the mental status of uh, the athlete. Oh, I'm muted. So, so no more questions from others. So, uh, uh, what? Uh, and my last question, probably, like what area you are heading uh, based on those uh, different different uh, applications and presentations? Because you have sports activities on uh, about five different different domains, mm -hmm. um, uh, like soccer, uh, and you presented in the uh, ABC conference and other conferences as well, mm -hmm. and journals. And similarly, you are working on the uh, uh, thermal issues and and others. So my query is that uh, I mean, which way, uh, which direction you are focusing now, based on your uh, experiences so far, so that you can um, have more uh, I mean robust contribution and uh, industry application uh, at the same time. So what do you think? Uh, just give us yeah, some so ideas. And, your, yeah. your last word, industry application, is the point, I yeah. think. Um, yeah, 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 as yeah. I said a little uh, at the, in the beginning of my talk, is that uh, most of one big reason why uh, up to now activity detection technology is not so much uh, widely used, I mean, except uh, walking, running, and the step calculation uh, techniques, I mean, it's not very uh, developed, is that. Um, Often, our research data are taken in some experimental and uh, not realistic conditions. And then when we want to use them uh, in real conditions in the field, then models are not working anymore. So uh, all other, other reason is uh, in, a, in the field or in a realistic environment, we cannot use the same sensors or uh, uh, very expensive equipment, etc. That's why, from the beginning, even it's if it's maybe more difficult and sensor data maybe less accurate, etc. We try to do whatever is possible using uh, wearable sensors, so device that may be used in the in the real field. And also, we try to uh, collect data not in uh, experimental and very uh, constrained condition, but collect data in very uh, realistic condition. So even for soccer, try to collect data in a real soccer play. So that's uh, so that if we can make accurate model, then we will know that our model has a great chance to be also working in a real field condition. So in the uh, if I can say industrial uh, uh, condition. So yeah, yeah. our target is try to provide this technology uh, in a way or in, a, in the form of some application or some software to um, as many people as possible so that everyone can enjoy the, the use of, enjoy the sports of course, but also uh, improve it, it himself uh, through this uh, skill quantification techniques. Okay, okay, thank you. So maybe I, I just uh, another query. Like, I mean, uh, um, are you focusing on healthcare applications? I know that thermal is one, but uh, for example, in hospital environment like rehabilitation, stroke patients, or Parkinson's disease, dementia. Uh, mm -hmm. For those cases, like sensors are important. Uh, from yeah. sensors, uh, not only sensors like video sensors are also important. But uh, the challenge you might uh, face or we face normally that when I am a patient and I don't like to wear anything extra uh, um, and any loosely bound sensors may not give me uh, profound information. So 
uh, based on your experience, can you give us some idea that I mean how to deal these kind of things? Um, if we deal with just uh, sports or healthcare, as mm -hmm. I said also during my talk, we cannot force the user to use some specific device. That's yeah. why we need our uh, algorithm and uh, system to be flexible to what the user mm -hmm. has. Uh, on the opposite, if we deal with uh, disease, then we can, uh, if I can say, uh, force the user. I mean, if your uh, doctor says to you, wear this <laughs> to, to be able to cure your disease, then even if you don't like uh, this uh, device, you you will wear it. So this hmm. is some thing different between uh, healthcare and uh, disease management. And um, in our work, we mainly target only um, sports and uh, exercise activity and healthcare because for a concrete uh, reason is that, um, <laughs> thank you, is that, uh, we don't have any uh, university hospital in our university, so uh, mm -hmm. don't have direct contact with uh, all these uh, disease and uh, illness, uh, uh, I mean, world. So th that's just the reason. Otherwise, uh, the techniques, I think, are, and the issues are quite uh, similar. Exactly, exactly. This is what I feel that, I mean, there is a huge uh, uh, opportunities to lead these kind of works with. Uh, but uh, uh, even if you don't have hospital, but you can just move to nearby hospitals and make some collaborations. Uh, that would be yeah. wonderful as well. But you, you we know discuss? that there is uh, yeah. so much uh, constraints when he, it comes to, to deal with uh, patients, etc. It's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. more difficult uh, to to make some mistakes, <laughs> etc. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so thank you very, very much indeed, Professor Lopez. Uh, can you see the slide? Like uh, one yes, certificate? Yes, of course. Of... Thank you. Oh, very course, much. thank you. So mm -hmm. this is just a certificate of gratitude for your excellent keynote speech and time, um, uh, and uh, it's a dinner time for you. And enjoy your dinner, and hope to see you again. Uh, uh, in person in our campus or uh, uh, probably, you know that uh, we are having uh, the conference, international conference, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 11th international conference on uh, uh, electronics, informatics and vision, ICIEV. Mm -hmm. It will be uh, held at our uh, beautiful mm -hmm. campus uh, uh, at the end of um, uh, October, so paper submission due by the end of this month. So yeah. maybe it will be extended a uh, few more days. Usually, if every conference we get a, a request from uh, many participants at the last moment to extend. So assume that we have four weeks in time, three to four weeks. So uh, like uh, previous time, we strongly encourage and advise you and request you to uh, attend and organize something at the same time. Uh, it will be online and on site. So if somebody cannot join, they can present online. But I wish you in person uh, in our campus once again and hope to see you again. Uh, thank so you. with thank that, you very much. Yeah, with thank that, you. I'd thank like you, to. Yes, thank you very much indeed. And uh, hope to uh, uh, see you all again. And thank you, Professor Arish Siddiqui. And uh, may, most of the participants are our different colleagues and overseas as well so participants from uh, UK, Japan and elsewhere. Uh, we found that they attended. So thank you so much and I uh, hope to see you again in person. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. for the invitation. Thank you all. Bye. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. All the best.